Hi, welcome to our home. I think one of my favorite stories about marriage is from a Dear Abby column. A man says, Dear Abby, I'm confused. I'm married, I have two kids, but I'm actually not living at home. I've fallen out of love with my wife and I'm living with her best friend. But that's not the problem. I'm actually in love with a third woman. And then he says, what would you say? And he finishes with a PS. Uh, don't give me any of that morality stuff. I don't believe in it. Sign confused. <laughs> well, dear Abby writes back succinctly, dear confused, the only difference between animals and humans is morality. So please consult a veterinarian. <laughs> Ever hear those words, my marriage is failing? We always thought that sour marriages only happen to other people, but now it's happening to you. But you didn't marry to be miserable. You married to be happy forever. But that ideal, that shine often fades. But now those words apply to you and the marriage that's in trouble lives in your house and that marriage is your marriage. You know, in all my years of counseling couples, I've never come across a problem marriage. Nope. But I have to say, I've seen boatloads of problem people who get married. You see, the reason that's so important to make that distinction is because marriage is not the problem. In fact, marriage is your hope. See, people's problem might be really a lack of maintenance on their marriage, and that's how problems result. I have seen those with unresolved character flaws that marriage seems to surface. And those flaws buoy up from the bottom with such a rush that they flood their marriage and threaten to swamp it. We think the marriage is failing when it's really not. The problem is simply that character flaws are surfacing. There may be character flaws in you or your partner, but your marriage is your greatest asset, actually. It's not the problem. It's your greatest asset. The story is told of a man who was laying flowers on his mother's tombstone when right next to him, a middle-aged man was crying like crazy, wailing. He wouldn't stop. And he, between wails, he could hear him say, why did you have to leave me? I can't live like this. Why did you have to die? Why? And the first man turned and said, excuse me, sir, I, I don't want to intrude, but what's the cause of such deep grief? Is it your mother that died, a child? He said, no, it's my my wife's first husband. <laughs> you know, we all have character flaws. And if we don't deal with them, we're going to carry them into every relationship. As I've always said, we can teach people what we know, but ultimately, we're going to reproduce what we are. Now, let me pause for a second and let me share with you. Do you know what's worse than losing a marriage? What's worse is never resolving the issues that led to losing that marriage. Because if those character flaws are left untreated, we only sentence ourselves to repeat the same mistakes next time. And each of us must learn to resolve our own flaws so that we can change for the better along the way. And then we can avoid repeating the same mistakes. No matter what stage or relationships we're in, we all need to hear this message. Some people might say, well, I'm not married uh, yet, but when I do, bursting into that Nat King Cole classic, because when I fall in love, it will be forever. <laughs> That's a nice song. But someone once said that on the way to the altar, you're going to discover there's three rings in each ceremony. There's going to be in the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the suffering. <laughs> but regardless of where you are, God's highest and utmost desire is always to heal and to restore. That's His greatest purpose for any of us in any stage of life, in any problem. He especially, though, wants to restore and heal marriages that seem to be sinking. The greatest miracle we can ever hope for 
is that marriages be restored to wholeness, and God especially has a desire to do that. But we must first recognize the faults that surface, regardless from whom it originates. And we've got to deal with the faults starting with our own and resolve them without losing the marriage. You don't want to ignore the faults. We would rather ignore them because to be truthful in order to resolve them, it'll require some emotional labor and we'd rather avoid that. But you cannot. You cannot make believe it's not there. Those flaws won't just disappear. It might be ignored, but ignoring it doesn't do anything. All it does is transfers a problem from your past into your future. And when you do, it stacks up with a corrosive effect. Now realize that the process of restoration isn't going to be nice and comfortable and pleasant. There's going to be the ugly, painful flaws on both sides. However, restoration is our, not only God's, but it has to be our ultimate goal. And that's the core of marriage. That's the divine reality. So to help us recognize some of these faults that'll arise in any marriage or in any relationship, I'm going to give you three guidelines to follow. And so follow me as we go inside and we'll take a look at the first of these guidelines. Because life is going to be a long trip together, you will want to make some agreements right at the beginning. In other words, you've got to prepare in advance. It's a lot like setting the coordinates on a plane flight before you take off. You set some coordinates, and if you set the wrong coordinates at the beginning, you'll end up somewhere you never expected. However, if you set your coordinates well, you'll have a much better chance to end up arriving exactly at your desired destination. The scripture says, a house is built by wisdom and becomes strong through good sense. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts of precious riches and valuables. That's out of the book of Proverbs. If you have a faith in God, then you've chosen the Bible as your guidebook for living. Another person may come along and say, you know, I love you, but I really don't want to follow the Bible as much as you do. So just let our love be stronger than anything else. <laughs> if you listen to that, you're dreaming. If you think it's going to work, it's not. Because there's no love that is stronger than God's love. Think of marriage like building a house. Let's say you agree on the big picture and you happily get started, but each of you starting from a different side of the house and you're going to meet in the middle and you're building. Problem is you're using different sets of blueprints. One starts on one end, and your significant other starts on the other end, and you just meet somewhere in the middle, right? Not quite. And it doesn't even matter how sincere you are in your efforts. It doesn't even matter how good a builder you are. It doesn't matter how much time you invest, money or resources you're putting into the building of this house. If you're building from different blueprints, when you come to the middle, there's going to be a huge rift and a huge fault line. So make sure that you both build with the same blueprint. You've got to start with the same architectural design. And then you work hard at sticking to those designs. So that at the point of contact, when you meet together in the middle, you'll meet squarely on target. Make sure you're reading from the same map, especially when it comes to your faith. Now, what if your marriage didn't start with following God's plans? 
Sometimes even Christians in a difficult relationship will rationalize and say, well, because I didn't marry according to God's will in the first place, therefore probably it's right for me just to end my marriage right now because the Lord would not want me to be unhappy. But stop for a moment. Think about that again. One bad decision is never going to re be repaired with another bad decision. God places great value on the words spoken when you were married. And He wants us to fulfill our vows to one another because He was present with us when we spoke the promise to one another. And He's still with us to help us keep them. See, the Lord repairs our lives by starting right where we are rather than undoing what we have done and trying to reverse the clock. He wants you to trust Him right where you are. Because you see, marriage is more than words. It's going to be action, and God's going to help you. If we value the gift of marriage, then He is going to show you how to do this. And there's two important things that He wants you to make sure that you emphasize. The first is, you've got to treasure your marriage. Here's a small illustration of what I mean. Some years ago, I, I was in, when I was in college, I scraped together all the money I had and bought a beautiful and expensive Martin guitar. But the melodious sound made it worth every penny. I plucked out many songs with that guitar and put many miles on that guitar, traversing throughout the globe as I carried it with me. We spent countless hours together practicing, songwriting, performing. I love my Martin guitar. It's going to be with me in my home until I die, and then when I die, I'll pass it on to my kids, my grandkids. Well, I decided that when the time came that it would need repairing, if it did, and it did, uh, I would take it to the best craftsman I could afford. Well, later on, the neck of my beautiful old guitar did get a little warped, and I took it to the best luthier around. And although he told me it might be quite expensive to fix it, I said, the cost is secondary to me. Please do the best you can to fix it because this guitar is like my life. You see, the cost was secondary. Why? Because I treasured that guitar. And whatever it would take to get it repaired, I was willing to pay. Why? Because part of my life was soaked into the wood of that instrument. You understand? And the same is true with our marriages. Our relationships may require repair from time to time, and they might even be a bit expensive to fix. But if you treasure your love, you will repair it at any cost. Your devotion must be so strong that you'll say, I don't care what it costs because I treasure this marriage. And when you treasure your marriage and commit to doing whatever it takes to repair it, you'll be surprised how many miracles will take place. You'll see how, through your commitment, that God will infuse His power and help you to heal your home. Now, some people tell me, Wayne, you, you don't know my wife. She's a high-maintenance woman. Well, of course your marriage is high-maintenance. If you wanted something low-maintenance, I'd suggest you just buy artificial flowers. You see, fake flowers are low-care. And the reason it is because they're dead. See, that's, that's what you get for maintenance-free flowers. But if you want a plant that grows, bears fruit, has a beautiful fragrance, then you'll have to water it, care for it. And there'll be times when you're going to have to trim it back, prune it, shape it. But you'll be willing to really work with it because it's fruitful. It's alive. It's thriving. And if that's how you want your marriage to be, you got to accept it as high maintenance. Some men come to me and they've complained. They say, well, my wife goes out and just buys so much. <laughs> yeah, you can probably prune that a bit, but you've got to be willing to pay a price. I know. 
When I walk through the mall with my wife, I hold her hand a lot and people think, oh, they see that and say, oh, how romantic. But I tell them that in actuality, uh, the reason I hold her hand is because when I let go, she shops. <laughs> I'm like the husband whose credit card was stolen, but he refused to report it. When they asked why, he said, well, the thief that was spending with his credit card was spending less than his wife. <laughs> Marriage is a high maintenance proposition. And if it's going to be a fruitful one, there's going to be a price, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Mark my words. Let me, if I could say something to the husbands, men treasuring a marriage really starts with us, not the other way around because we set the tone for our homes. As the leader or the head of our families, we provide the loving direction in our marriage. And the way to treasure your marriage and to keep it treasured, here's a simple tip. Speak value into your spouse and into your children. I often say to men, the best thing you can do for your children is to love their mother and to speak well of her in their presence. You see, wives and even children take their cue from dad or husband. Uh, do you remember when you were dating? Uh, you, you'd say to your girlfriend or your fiance, you're so beautiful, or you did that so well. What you just did was you infused value into her. She'll actually feel valuable in your presence. But the problem is after the wedding, men stop passing out those compliments as freely. And as a result, wives feel less valued as time goes on. The depreciation flows right on down to the kids as well. Can I encourage you husbands, don't stop giving value to your wife and to your children because the way you treasure your marriage matters more than anything else you do. If you don't treasure your wife, you just might end up like the man who left church one Sunday feeling convicted that he wasn't doing enough for his other half. So he stopped at a perfume store and he said to the clerk, I'd like to buy some perfume for my wife. Well, the lady who was the clerk said, wow, if there were only more men like you, so the clerk brought out this beautiful, wonderful bottle of perfume. It was priced at $150 and the guy choked and he says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's way too much. Do you have something cheaper? She, well, she found a $50 bottle and she said, what about this one? Oh, too much. The husband said, shaking his head, you have something cheaper. And the sales lady mumbled on her way back. What a cheapskate. Then she returned with another bottle marked down to $30. And she said, how's this? He said, too much still. I want something cheaper. Finally, she said, what do you want? He said, I want to see something really cheap. So she pulled out a mirror. <laughs> you see, don't let that be your reflection. Be sure to value each other in marriage. And by treasuring each other, you will cause everyone in your home to appreciate, not depreciate, appreciate like a house or equity or real estate. You will appreciate in significance as the years go by. In case you're thinking that this is just window dressing for your marriage, it's not, but let's probe a little deeper. How can you hang on when you want to let go? Here's another secret. Stay committed to the one committed to you. Stay committed to the one committed to you. See, the beauty of your marriage vow is that they were spoken not just by two people, but it was spoken before God himself. Stay committed to the one who's committed to you. He's still working to help you fulfill that commitment. God is. And when you're running out of strength, trust in the faith of Christ. Do everything you can to cooperate 
with the prayers that Jesus is praying over your marriage. Do you know that? He's really praying for your marriage. He's for you. Remember, by the way, the secret of a lasting marriage is falling in love again and again and always with the same person. God's going to help you. Stay committed to Him. Trust Him. We well, say, well, what are some practical steps that you can take? Here's one. Become honest friends. See, people don't fall out of love initially. They fall out of friendship initially. If there's a struggle in your marriage and you lose friendship with your wife, think about it. It doesn't matter at that point who's right or wrong. Because if you fall out of friends, if you don't like each other, if you're no longer friends, it really doesn't matter. On the other hand, if you are committed to be friends, you can work out the problem because your relationship isn't based on performance. It's based on friendship. Your marriage is worth far more than any issue that comes up. If you're friends, for example, if Anna and I fell out of friendship, doesn't matter if she has the right answer to our problem, doesn't matter even if she had a prophetic word from God, I would not listen to her because I wouldn't like her. Then it is no longer a matter of who's right or wrong anymore. And even if God has the answer, you won't accept it because you stepped out of that relationship of friendship. And when that friendship fails, then I become a person that's impossible to please. I resist any solution. So work to be able to say that your husband or your wife is your best friend. Say it. Do whatever it takes. Pay whatever price is required and make the necessary sacrifices to regain the friendship of your spouse. And if you make the choice to be friends, then you can honestly say, Honey, I know we have some problems, but it doesn't matter. Because no matter what, that's secondary. I'm going to be your friend. We can lose this house. We can live in a rental or sleep in a pup tent. But whatever happens, we're going to be friends. And I'm committed to treasure our marriage. You matter to me more than anything else. I remember Mary Alda saying, she was a wife of uh, Alan Alda, she, she once said this, she said, in our society, it's becoming easier and easier to leave your spouse. But in any society, it will always remain difficult to leave your best friend. So keep your friendship with your partner. Confess faults one to another. Do everything you can to apologize. Humble yourself. Whatever else you might need to do to maintain your friendship. That's critical. Become deeply invested in your friendship with your spouse. That will be your greatest treasure. This next tip is a very important one, and that is to seek and submit to godly counsel. When you purchase a brand new car, you also are wise to take out a service contract because nothing always stays new forever. So too, in a marriage, it's wise in the early days to plan in advance for what may take place. We should have an agreement with our spouses that if anything goes wrong in our marriage, we will seek and submit to godly counsel. And if we don't plan this in advance, then when things go bad and it hits the skids, well, pride sets in and at least one in the marriage will usually refuse to get counseling. Many times we really do need a third person to help us see things clearly and objectively. We can become too emotionally involved to figure things out on our own, and, and so we really do need to seek and submit to counsel. Now remember, it's not enough to seek counsel. We have to make the choice to submit to it as well. The Bible says it in this way, listen to counsel and accept discipline so that you may be wise the rest of your days. These two phrases are so important and powerful. Listen to counsel and then it adds and accept the discipline necessary to do both. Not just one or the other. Don't ever say, well, I'm fine. And if you want to go to counseling, then you go right ahead. I've heard that. I don't need counseling. The Bible 
describes you, if that's your way of thinking, describes us as a fool. You see, in every marriage, there are three sides to the story. Yes, three. <laughs> your side, the other side, and the truth. <laughs> Sometimes only someone sitting on the outside can see what we're both missing on the inside of our home. And to those of you who are just getting married, make a prenuptial agreement. Oh, not about money, about getting counsel. Make your commitment that if your marriage ever starts sinking and you can't pull it out on your own in a reasonable amount of time, that you'll both commit to getting help. What I'm about to say to you in this segment is not the ideal, but it's the reality, and that is this. Sometimes marriages don't survive, but you must, and you can if you'll hold on to your faith. Then even in the midst of everything spinning out of control around us, God will still be able to lead you safely home. Hebrews chapter 6 tells us this. God has given us both His promise and His oath, and that He would be there for us. This is the confidence, and it's like a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. An anchor. You need to be able to say, Lord, I know that you're the one that makes me whole. My source or my anchor of joy is found in you and you alone, not on how well my marriage is performing. My soul must be anchored in you. Please grab a hold of that and you'll have your anchor. Now, please hear my heart for you as I speak into this very rough situation. Sometimes you'll feel like the world is caving in on you. You may feel like a drowning swimmer lost at sea in the midst of a hurricane. But here's the life preserver that I want to throw out to you. Anchor yourself in Christ, not the state of your marriage or finances or anything else. If He's your anchor, He will bring you through. Let me say it again. He will bring you through. So regardless of whether you have a great or not so great marriage, your wholeness will never come from your marriage. It will always come from Christ. Nothing ever can change that. So keep your heart anchored in Christ so that you can find strength beyond yourself and He will help you to love more than you are able to feel and you'll be able to walk farther than you could ever imagine. And if we can ever help, please contact us here at the office and, and we'll do whatever we can to help you navigate the season in a way that God will be pleased. God bless you. God bless you and your home.